Hi, with the pending changes to the selective school test, I've been doing a lot of reading on critical thinking and uh, higher order thinking skills and so on. And I read this report today, which is about how to teach critical thinking. Uh, and it was commissioned by the New South Wales Department of Education, as you can see here. Uh, so I actually read all of this paper and I found it to be pretty interesting and I agreed with a lot of it, which was good to see. So a bit about the author here, uh, BA from Duke University, PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Harvard. So pretty prestigious institutions there. Professor of Psychology at uh, the University of Virginia. So that uh, he has a focus on brain basis of learning and memory cognitive psychology k to 16 i guess that includes a uh, university i haven't heard that term before all right so some uh books that he's written why don't students like school when can you trust the experts see that's the first question that was raised on that self-evaluation of critical thinking skills that i posted earlier uh, raising kids to read and the reading mind uh all right so and yeah he's had a a bit of success there. So the first thing that uh, jumps out at me is I wonder why they had to commission an American professor to look into this. I always find that interesting when they go outside of Australia because um, I don't think an American professor is really going to have an understanding of the full context at play in Australia, particularly in Sydney, where there's a sort of a, a, a very uh, esoteric culture revolving around the, the tutoring and uh, selective and OC industry. All right, so he goes on, he starts off saying that, uh, you know, what critical thinking is, and uh, he sort of postulates as to whether it can be taught very effectively. So uh, the, uh, a large number of more specific skills or more generic skills, all right, and uh, he recommends a four-step process to develop a program to teach critical thinking. So identify a list of critical thinking skills for each subject domain. Yeah, something he talks about in this in depth is how you need to, to be able to apply the different thinking skills within different contexts. Uh, identify subject matter content for each domain. Yeah, that, that's all fine. And plan the sequence in which knowledge and skills should be taught and revisited across the years. All right, so uh, let's see how he defines... Uh, how should matter? See, you, you see here, if I underline this, how the politics uh, permeates through everything you read these days. You know, how should teachers discuss misdeeds of a nation's founders? That's a very big question at the moment, where you see, you know, the talk of uh, colonization and so forth in all the Western countries really skewing the way things are taught. All right, it's not clear what we know that we know what we mean by critical thinking. You are thinking critically. If one, your thinking is novel, that means new. That is, you aren't simply drawing a conclusion from a memory of a previous situation. And two, your thinking is self-directed. That is, you are not merely executing instructions given by someone else. And your thinking is effective. So yeah, that, that's not a bad. I really like some of uh, these quotes. Consider both sides of an issue. That's something I always do. So I'm gonna say something here that I state to my students that's probably uh, most teachers would find controversial but uh, you know when children are asked to present a speech on multiculturalism and they almost all universally say how wonderful it is you would have to think the critical thinking child would be thinking oh what about monoculturalism right is that any good has anyone looked at that and actually within the media monoculture cultures are often portrayed as being good they throw up Finland, they throw up Japan. So consider both sides of an issue. Yeah, that's something you should do on everything, but often doesn't apply in uncomfortable positions. You know, I wonder if a child would be allowed to make a speech saying that multiculturalism isn't as good as monoculturalism and offer evidence for claims made and don't let emotion interfere with reason. Well, I really love that one right? because often when you argue with someone, they get upset and that makes it very difficult to argue. Uh, all right, uh, thinking as, a, as key, thinking when others might not. So he gives an example how, you know, you just observe things going on in the world and you think about, well, why do, they, why do they do this? You know, why don't you do something else? Yeah, that's something I do all the time. All right, 
right. Uh, we want them to question articles they read in the media, for example, or think through whether the claims of an advertisement make sense. This appetite for cognitive work when others might avoid it seems to be partly a matter of personality. That's a very good point, I think. Sometimes I'll be with people and I'll make an observation about something and they'll say, why do you care? See, and I think it's, I have an appetite for cognitive work and others might not. Others might be cognitively lazy. Of course, they, you know, you wouldn't, they wouldn't want you to say that about them, but it seems pretty evident. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a lot of messages. I should have turned Facebook off before I started this, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on for the time being. So he goes on to say critical thinking can be taught. Uh, planning how to teach, it seems to be the problem. So it talks about different uh, subjects and so on and uh, how, how you would try to teach it. So I like this one example he gives of how uh, during uh, Navy operations, uh, officers were able to make, uh, to change their thinking based on uh, scenarios they had only recently learned about. Uh, and many examples of critical thinking skills that are open to introduction. So planning how to teach students to think critically should be perhaps our second task. Our first should be reassuring ourselves that such instruction is needed and can succeed. All right, we think of something bigger than its domain of training. When I teach students how to evaluate the argument in a set of newspaper editorials, I'm hoping that they will learn to evaluate arguments generally. Yeah, it's very, very true. Not just those they read and not just those they would find in other editorials. So this is called transfer. This is a big thing, I think. So when you learn one skill of critical thinking, you've got to learn how to apply it to other contexts. So teaching critical thinking for general transfer. Uh, this is the idea was, yeah, so there was a psychologist who said that you actually couldn't uh, transfer it. He was saying that, uh, you know, knowing how to, to estimate the area of a rectangle wouldn't help you estimate other shapes. But the theory did not die. So apparently people stood do still believe that you can transfer critical thinking skills across domains. So this example they give is uh, computer programming. This is a very good one, I think, because I used to do a lot of computer programming. And I think if you, you work in a field like that, you really will uh, apply those skills of logic to other areas. And, uh, you know, because you have to be able to compile your programming, you have to have perfect syntax when you write a program. So computational thinking, that's another one of the elements of thinking skills that is uh, really stressed here. And you see all the other metacognition, spatial skills and reasoning and so forth. It is no surprise that programs in school meant to teach general critical thinking skills have had limited success. All right, I'll talk a little bit about this. And this will be a controversial statement uh, because I've worked in education for quite a long time now. And I did a degree in education simply because, and I didn't have to do it, I already had several university degrees in unrelated fields, but um, I thought I would do it to see if I had the, the sort of the nous to, to be able to teach young children because I was interested in, to, in going into primary school teaching. Now, the interesting thing is that when I did my other degrees, I, I didn't feel like I stood out that much from other people. Right, like particularly when I did IT, I felt like no, it was full of uh, you know tech nerds, uh, mostly males at that time, to uh, all very literate, very intelligent, you know, fast thinkers. I didn't stand out amongst them that much, I don't think. Then when I went to my primary teaching degree, I feel I really stood out. You know, it was like, wow, I seem to be able to do things a lot faster than most of the people here, you know, and actually people would sort of, uh, it seems odd to say it, but uh, when I would post on the university forums, you know, I would write the way I write on my forum. You know, other, other prospective teachers would actually sort of laugh at me for using, you know, big words and things. They would say, what's the point of that? And I just thought, oh, this is really weird. I used to talk like this on IT forums with other people and uh, they use the exact same rhetoric and no one ever cared. And now I'm, you know, in an educational context 
and people are actually making fun of it. It seemed antithetical to the idea of, of education. And to be honest, in Australia, that feeling permeates throughout education. There's a real sort of mediocrity that, that goes through, particularly primary teaching. That's the area I'm most familiar with. So I'm going to say that most primary teachers are not critical thinkers themselves. And so therefore, how are they going to be able to teach it? Now, people probably think that's an uncomfortable statement to make, but, um, and look, it's not a judgment on the teachers themselves. All right? it's, that's something that people confuse again, that they conflate that. And one of the things in that critical thinking self-evaluation I posted said, you know, you're able to criticize things without feeling like you're a bad person. Yeah, I am able to do that. I am aware, though, people are going to think I'm a bad person for doing it. I don't really understand why, because I'm not saying I'm a better person than that person. I think that would be a ridiculous thing to say, because what metric are you going to use to measure it? But I am saying that I think I'm a better critical thinker than these people. And I have examples of when I would do, you know, maths things at school and a professional development person would come out to the school and try to teach us you know, how to do things. And it was quite obvious, you know, I was able to do things much faster than them. And, you know, but they, they just didn't want to accept it. They would be like, well, why are you a primary school teacher? You know, what, what are you doing here? And I sometimes still get that response, you know, of like, well, you know, you don't belong here, you know, which just seems ridiculous. You would think you would want uh, the most critical thinkers and the most capable thinkers working in an educational context. But yeah, of course, all of my brilliant students are not going to go on to become teachers. They're going to go on to something that's far more rewarding in a pecuniary sense. So yeah, that quote, uh, and he even says it's no surprise. Yeah, I think that largely comes down to the teachers. Uh, okay, adults, da, 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 da. there's no surprise the programs in schools have failed. Uh, perhaps five hours each week of critical thinking, rig rigorous test of transfer. So yeah, in this uh, part, he pretty much says that it's difficult to transfer the skills because uh, you know one set of logic won't work in another domain, right? So you know some rules in maths won't work in history. And this is obviously true, right? So this, again, it's just another element of critical thinking of realizing there are different contexts. For example, many of the rules I apply and I even explain to the, the children when I teach them, I say, you know, here, I'm a teacher, you're a student. Somewhere else, we're not that. You know, we don't have the same relationship outside of this place. So I make jokes about it with the children. I say, have you come up and say hi to me, you know, when I'm not teaching you? I might tell you to get lost, you know, because I'm not teaching you now. And we laugh about it. It's a joke. But I want them to understand, yeah, that the same rules don't apply in every context. And that should be obvious to a critical thinker. Uh, so the problem is that people who learn these broadly applicable principles in one situation often fail to apply them in a new situation. So, that, yeah, that's, I don't think that is a problem, really, if you can model strategies for how to transfer skills and how to to change skills across platforms. It is not useful to think of critical thinking skills once acquired as broadly applicable analysis, synthesis and evaluation mean different. And that's a fair enough quote. It's pretty much what we've been saying. Uh, so yeah, there's a Example here where he relates a problem that was given, uh, given to students revolving a particular type of ray. And then there was a, so I've talked about this. This is where I think uh, the critical thinking skills are going to go. Other subjects read a story describing a military situation analogous to the medical problem. So yeah, this is something that a lot of students do have trouble with, that they, they're not able to read, say, a story and relate it to a real world situation where they could apply the same logic. So they're saying here the analogy was not hard. The problem was thinking to use it in the first place. So these results offer a new perspective on critical thinking. The problem in transfer is not just that different domains have different norms. The problem is that previous critical thinking successes seem encapsulated in memory. So 
Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with this entirely because I've never really studied critical thinking in uh, any explicit manner. And a lot of this stuff that, uh, that this guy's talking about, it just seems self-explanatory to me. And in fact, when he gets to uh, the example of the maths problem, I'll just get down to that. But uh, uh, confronted with a problem, we tend to dwell on the surface structure. And so we fail to realize we've thought through a problem before. Yeah, this is kind of related to the story again. And even like when we talk about pattern recognition, I think the reason I'm more aware than a lot of other people of what's going on in society at the moment is that I see the patterns, you know, like when I would do an IQ test, I would see all of the patterns faster than other people. Now I'm seeing them in society, right? I look at situations and just like you have a triangle or a rectangle or a square, you know, you now have this ethnicity, this gender and so on. And you can shift all the parts around and you can see where they're heading. It's not really hard to see, you know, which one comes next in the series. And that's why I keep saying, yeah, get rid of selective school. That's what's going to happen. It's re I really think it will eventually happen. So, you know, that's it'll be interesting to see because I've predicted all of these changes thus far. You know, I've modeled my teaching for about, say, the last five years on all of these things I'm only learning about now that are going to be part of thinking skills, metacognition, metacognition ethical reasoning, critical thinking, computational thinking. I mean, I've talked about that for a long time, that, you know, you want to apply algorithms to things in your problem solving. You know, I know I do that when I have to solve a problem. I try and think through it as systematically as possible. You know, I don't do it emotionally at all. So, yeah, these are all things that have sort of seemed common sense to me, and I imagine to a lot of people who are critical thinkers. All right, so they, they talk about these things, deep structure and surface structure. So yeah, the deep structure of something would be to see all those analogies and see that a problem is the same. It's just the variable has changed. And this is what, uh, you know, things like the, or bodies like the Department of Education don't seem to notice. Like they're complaining about inequity in schools, but they don't complain about it in other things. Well, I guess they're the Department of Education, so they should only worry about education. But I mean society in general. It doesn't watch, say, a, a rugby league game and complain about the overrepresentation of certain races. Like, why hasn't someone complained? Oh, there's no Asian people playing rugby league. It must be racist, right? Yet no one says that. Yet if you turn it around and you look at a school, an elite school, and you say, oh, well, it's all Asian people, so it must be racist. Yeah, then people accept that. So there, I think he's right in that, that most people tend to dwell on the surface structure. And uh, even though the surface structure is almost the same in both those scenarios I've represented, probably most of the people who care about education don't care about rugby league. So then they're showing their bias. They're saying, well, I'm going to be a good person and advocate for this, but I'm only going to advocate for the things I care about. And that seems to me very common amongst people. You know, their, their child has some problem, so they become advocates for it, which you know, really is quite narcissistic if you think about it. And if you get deep into ethical reasoning and thought experiments, you actually wonder, yeah, you can put this question to children and parents, why do you care more about your own child than another child? Right? It's a quintessential philosophical thought experiment. Uh, you know, because most kids think, oh, yeah, my parents are mean to me and they're making me do this and they're making me do that. Yeah, how would you like it if they just forgot about you and uh, helped some kid who's smarter than you, perhaps, and doesn't have access to the resources you do? And yeah, maybe the child will think about things differently there. Anyway, yeah, he talks about how people don't uh, see the, diff the similarities there. And this is that maths problem I posted. So his uh, hypothesis was that, you know, kids could rote learn a strategy to solve this problem. Trisha can paint a house in 14 hours and Carol can do it in eight. How long would it take them to paint one house working together? Uh, a student who learns a sequence of steps to solve that sort of problem is often thrown by a small change. The homeowner had already painted a quarter of the house before hiring Trisha and Carol. Now, I did that problem, you know, including that, and I posted it on my Facebook group and uh, didn't seem to change the difficulty, really. So I wonder if that's uh, sort of 
a bit of an ignorance on the author on the author of this paper uh, on their part of the cultures at play in Sydney where you know a lot of the kids getting into selective they have very advanced math sk skills might not be the same in the areas he's worked in uh, anyway yeah open-ended problems this is where he tends he talks about how it's better to have open-ended problems than uh, multiple choice ones and ones with uh, you know arbitrary answers so the wrecking yeah oh this is this sort of problem yeah so yeah that 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 is a problem I think in the selective test in the moment where at the moment where kids may have uh, wrote learned or memorized certain strategies so you probably do want questions that are put to kids who are claiming to be pretty intelligent to be of an innovative nature so he compares chess uh, here he says you know chess players have memorized you know thousands of situations and are able to compare those really quickly so yeah that's not a bad analogy actually uh, you know no in chess you're almost never going to be confronted with a new problem I don't think you've just dealt with it so many times uh, so just as with routine problems critical thinking for open-ended problems is enabled by extensive stories stores of knowledge about the domain uh, working memory he talks about that that's something I'm very interested in how um, I think uh, you know people at the high end of the IQ scale have a much uh, larger working memory than other people and yeah as I continue to do numerical reasoning with kids I'm able to see that most of them don't have say my capacity for being able to do mental manipulation of numbers which is interesting to me so but I do think it is something they could improve with practice in that area so he goes on with the uh, chess analogy so you would imagine most good chess players have a high or a large working memory uh, it probably applies to language skills as well most people who can call on a vast repertoire of vocabulary probably have a large working memory you know I hear a word and I'm able to sort of quickly move five synonyms into my working memory so I know when kids ask me oh, what's a synonym for this I can go bang 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 you know I don't have to think about it too much so it's if you compare the brain to a processor it's got something to do with that uh, look for hidden assumptions yeah this is good uh, this see this is what I think a lot of the coaching colleges are gonna do they're gonna say yeah look for hidden assumptions and the problem in that is yeah well how you, how do you know something's an assumption and how do you know it's hidden so you're gonna have to be exposed to lots and lots of different articles and uh, so many articles and even the department's own articles are full of assumptions full of fallacies uh, you just have to have so much experience to be able to determine it I mean it's easy to see how children would believe things like uh, you know oh boys are given privileges in maths you know that's why they're better at it or something you know how is a little boy or a little girl gonna know that that might not be true you know or if you're told that girls are better at reading it's like yeah little boys probably gonna believe that you know? and it's like no it's probably not true it's a you know completely based on these stereotypes that that people are happy to debunk in other areas but not so much in these right so uh, da, 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 better so they they say they've got lots of uh, research that so it shows that people's uh, skills don't transfer adequately across domains all right so this video is getting a little bit long I probably uh, sort of digressed a little bit too much even my students this week were telling me I have a, a tendency to digress that's something I call teaching in the moment where you know someone will raise something interesting and I, I have a propensity to talk about it at length so yeah there, there's the quote I posted to the group so he does say that he thinks children are more open to being uh, taught critical thinking now, I think this bit's very interesting for me see he's considering the school context when he says a teacher can still include critical thinking content but it's quite likely they will learn more if their learning is coordinated across years so see the thing is as a tutor you know when I do a class that's like three hours or something I can include critical thinking in everything I do you know I like the course I'm going to be doing next term I am going to do that I'm going to teach thinking skills you know to with the GA slant you know here's abstract reasoning in a pattern 
Here's abstract reasoning and comprehension. There's how you can use both of them. Then we will read a text for, for English, which will again involve abstract reasoning and uh, ethical reasoning and so on. Then we would do a writing piece where we're looking at being objective, looking at not using assumptions ourselves, uh, considering different perspectives. See, this is the, the sort of the more power that you have as a tutor compared to a teacher because, you know, if you're a teacher in a school and you've got 30 students, and, and he, he says that in this report, many kids are not going to be capable of critical thinking. Uh, basically, they're types of students. He said, you know, there's kids who are struggling with just the fundamentals, and that's not to denigrate them, but, yeah, if they're struggling to read and write, I mean, they're not going to be able to, to go on to these uh, harder, more harder areas of study. So, so he says, uh, you know, you reduce expectations for those children. But if you give me, uh, you know, reasonably gifted children in a tutoring context, which I've had the good fortune to have, you know, I sometimes have had classes full of OC kids. Uh, you can just do anything with those kids. You know, I, I would even posit that I've had better debates with some Year Five kids than I have with adults, you know, that they have insight into things. And the best thing I ever hear is when a year five child will tell me, oh, this is, you know, so interesting to talk about these things. And, you know, all we do at, you know, our other tutoring is three times three. You know, someone actually said that to me once. And, yeah, I said to him three times three is useful, you know, rote learning is useful, but the way things are heading is this whole critical thinking sphere. So the assessment thing I also posted uh, to the group. So essentially, I eventually think everything will be assessed by AI because everything will be open-ended and it's too expensive to pay humans to, to mark open-ended tests, which is why they want to have multiple choice tests. See, there's a sad thing about you know money simply dictating uh, the way things are going. You know, they have to save money so you have multiple choice tests. Uh, students' difficulty in this area is such a common complaint. Educators are often frustrated that student thinking seems shallow. Yeah, this is true of a lot of young children, but they're not interested in peeling away the layers to examine the true problem underneath. But I think if you can provide it in the form of interesting texts, interesting situations, and I've had enough experience of having smart kids. Yeah, they enjoy it, right? I give them texts that highlight problems. You know, how does this text compare to what's going on in society today? You know, how does this behavior you're exhibiting compare to this other behavior that is criticized? You know, looking at the ethics of uh, different scenarios, I think children are very capable of exploring these different scenarios. So I actually think uh, this, this person who's written this report isn't really aware of uh, the power of, that a tutor could have in this context. All right, and then it goes on to have all its references. So yeah, I thought it was an interesting report and it's given me uh, a few good ideas as to how to incorporate critical thinking in my own teaching. But to be honest, it's nothing new to me. And uh, that maths problem that was posited as likely being difficult. I'm, I'm probably going to pose that problem to to my thinking class, my thinking skills class next week of year five students. I don't envision any of them will have a problem solving it just because you added one line to it. So I think um, Daniel Willingham is underestimating the, the, uh, the prowess of this certain group that are looking to get into selective schools in New South Wales. And that might also be true of the department, that they are so concerned about the coaching colleges that they just think everything is rote learning and that the kids can't do anything on their own. And that might be true of the mediocre students, but I don't really think it is true of the vast bulk of kids who are getting into OC and selective, at least at the very top schools. I don't think it applies. Anyway, sorry for the length of this and I uh, hope some of it has provided some interesting food for thought for you. Please give me any feedback that would be greatly appreciated.